here today, very excited to talk to you about uh, how we're helping one of our wonderful clients, uh, retail client, uh, truly unlock the power of Vault Enterprise. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm Amar Malik. I'm from Accenture, and uh, we've been we've been helping our client for a couple of months now. Um, and just a bit of a profile on this uh, this particular customer. They're a retail client. Um, they're well underway on their cloud transformation journey. Um, and, you know, they're using the HashiCorp stack quite a bit. So not only Vault, but they're also using Terraform, Console, Nomad, um, and they're, you know, uh, experimenting with some of, some of the other open source tool sets. Um, in terms of their workloads, you know, it's uh, their, their applications are very uh, uh, resource intensive. A lot of consumers are actually leveraging their applications from a from a client facing perspective. Uh, but in the back end, those applications are are using um, uh, open source Vault uh, to consume the secrets. And so about late, about earlier this year in the summer, the, the client had a uh, business requirement to move from the open source Vault to the enterprise uh, Vault, uh, and that was for two primary reasons. One was they were looking for more available, high availability as well as disaster recovery in in their service. Um, so they were using open source for uh, you know a number of months and and even a couple of years. I would say um, they saw that more and more of their applications were starting to consume and leverage this central platform, which is Vault. Um, and and they realized that you know this is becoming a critical service, and so we it's better to have high availability and disaster recovery in place. So. That was that was one of the, the the business drivers to move towards enterprise vault, um, and the other one was the the concept and a bit an ability to use uh, to use namespaces, right? So so again, one of the key tenants of of this particular client's cloud transformation journey was self service and autonomy, um, and so uh, you know they wanted to really unlock these two main features of enterprise vault and and uh, they engaged Accenture to help with this journey. So I'll talk a bit about, I'll go in, into a bit about those business drivers, uh, again, DR, high availability, and the namespace. And then I'll talk about how we help them uh, do this implementation and, and migration off of open source to enterprise fairly quick in a short time frame. So from an AJ perspective, uh, you know, we we follow the recommendation from HashiCorp in terms of their uh, uh, multi-cluster architecture, um, and so we had five uh, Vault nodes distributed across three availability zones, right? And with this architecture, uh, the client would be able to uh, sustain a failure and uh, a loss of two nodes within the cluster or a loss of an entire availability zone. And the way we designed and implemented it was was you know, using auto scaling groups um, and, and we had designed it in a way that if a node were to go down for whatever reason, um, you know, the auto scaling event would kick off and the node would rejoin the cluster automatically. Right. Um, at the back, in terms of the back end storage, the storage was using integrated storage, whereas their current open source was using console. However, in the enterprise version that we were implementing, we decided to go with uh, integrated storage. Right. And that, that again, for, for a number of reasons, one being that it's um, uh, less administration and overhead in, in terms of managing the overall solution. Um, and it supports some of that failover and multi-cluster replication um, a bit easier than what console offers. And uh, and of course, you know, we had we had backups there. Um, you know, we had backups of the RAP storage, not only we had it on a daily as well as a weekly basis. Um, and so, you know, having having that HA kind of set up with the integrated storage that did allow us to cast a safety net in case that, you know, this critical platform were to go down, we have, you know, we have a recovery mechanism. And, and from the D, uh, DR perspective, you know, that, again, that's another a lot of a, a big reason why enterprise customers even even go down this path is so they have disaster recovery replication. Um, and so the way we designed it was, again, this is all running on AWS. Sorry if I didn't mention that earlier, but this is all cloud cloud ready. They're heavy users of AWS. Um, and so from a DR perspective, we we mirrored the uh, five node cluster architecture from the from the uh, primary region to the secondary region. And uh, and, you know, we did our testing to ensure that, you know, uh, that data is synchronized. Uh, and, and, you know, auth methods, policies, and some of the basic stuff, those were being replicated as well. From a, from a namespaces perspective, you know, again, trying to achieve and, and really unlock that self-service and autonomy. 
uh, we, 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 there was a business decision made by the client to, to kind of start opening this up, right? Again, from, from where we're starting, which is open source, it was centrally managed by one team. Uh, there was a bit of a, there was a bit of a bottleneck, I would say as well. And, uh, and, and, you know, with the namespaces, we wanted to, um, really open it up, right. And, and give, give the opportunity to the uh, application teams to manage, manage their tenant of the vault. Right. So. Uh, with that, I would say, you know, it, it did work out well, but there's definitely some lessons learned that I, I want to share with you as well. Uh, one of the lessons learned is that, you know, we can't open the floodgates necessarily for everyone to start using their namespaces, right? So we had a pretty rigid onboarding process so that the app teams actually had to um, prove that, that they could, they could have, they could, they had the experience within their teams to manage namespaces. Right, but uh, yeah, I would say it's a, it's a very great feature of the enterprise vault because it does reduce some of that bottleneck and that single point of failure uh, from from the teams. In terms of how we implemented it, uh, again, I think you know the point to be made here is that it was it was automation was a key component uh, to the implementation. Um, we were able to deploy the entire solution plus the testing plus the onboarding in a fairly short amount of time. And I would probably attribute that to one is the codification and deployment through Terraform and, and the integration with AWS. Um, so we were able to spin up our, basically our entire enterprise vault environment in, in, uh, in multiple kind of iterations and, and we were able to test it. And um, if there were any, if there were any issues, if there are any changes in the requirements, we were able to demonstrate to the client fairly quickly through this pipeline that we had built. The other the other thing to call out in terms of the actual implementation journey was the bootstrapping of the EC2 instances. Um, and so we had configured it in a way that if a node were to die in the in the auto scale group, that a new node would spin up with the right configurations, um, with the with the right certificates installed already, um, and with the ability to join the existing cluster. Right. So there is some automation already built into that. Uh, and that that proved to be very effective when we were doing our testing and our demonstrations to the client. And then the other thing from the implementation perspective, uh, which we didn't have in the open source and we, we, we tried to do in the enterprise was the monitoring and alerting. Right. So again, we use the cloud native capabilities in AWS like uh, like CloudWatch um, to, to have pretty, pretty much interactive dashboards and, and have a health check over the status of vault. Right. And so this was this was something that the client wanted and we delivered that uh, pretty effectively. Um, and, and that was the, that was really the base implementation. So so again, it was very, very quick. The next piece, probably the more difficult piece was to get the uh, the end users to start using the enterprise vault. Right. And from there, it was, you know, the onboarding procedure. Uh, there was a lot of, I would say, curveballs in our journey to put it. Uh, to put it lightly, but uh, you know we had to onboard them fairly quickly. Uh, but you know it, it was a bit of an emergency onboard. I'll, I'll, I'll be quite quite honest there. But in terms of the migration, we were able to copy across. You know, with the root token of the open source vault, we were able to copy across policies and and key value engines. Um, and then you know the, the the thing that was outstanding or where we had to interact and talk to the app teams quite a bit was for the auth methods. Right. So that's that's a bit about the migration journey. Uh, I would you know, I want to leave I want to leave you with a couple of lessons learned here in, in our engagement that we had with this uh, with this particular client. The first one is the key management. Right. So again, in the open source version of the vault, you know, the client was using uh, was using Shamir's secret keys and there was multiple key shards. Um, you know, I think even in open source, you have the ability to integrate with the, with the cloud a cloud key management system. So I think you know the the, the process for Shamir is is good. It's a manual, but it, it it can it can become painful, right? If you have many vault clusters and you have many holders of the keys, um, and so if there's no real reason like you know that's holding you back from using auto unseal i would definitely recommend it because it just makes it so much easier right when you want to upgrade or when you want to do a migration like like the one i just spoke about so that's one thing i would highly encourage and recommend to use that auto unseal capability 
the other one is backups right like again this is something that we often forget about or we don't really pay it too much attention to but make sure to validate those backups um, because you know we sometimes we think that we have the backups but they not they don't, might not necessarily be work in working condition so uh, you know review the backup schedule make sure that your backups are there and, and they're working um, and then is to I would say is to have a onboarding layer, right? So um, have wrap some governance and uh, onboarding processes around the vault uh, environment, right? So uh, uh, you know people should not be getting access to things that they don't need to, even if that access is being provisioned. We should have some sort of mechanism to review that access and and deprovision it in an automatic uh, in an automatic manner. Uh, and then lastly, I would say, um, you know, avoid some of the anti patterns for for vault usage, uh, because we've seen time and time again, people are using, you know, from an app role perspective, using role ID and secret ID, um, and, and they're hard coding it into into the into the application itself, right. So we want to move away from that, we want to use ephemeral secrets as much as possible. Um, and so that's something I would say, you know, it's, it's definitely worth doubling down on and, and focusing on that with the client. Um, so, so that's that. That's that's all. That's all that I want to discuss about. And uh, you know, we we did have a lot of lessons learned out of this engagement and this uh, opportunity that we had with the client. Um, you know, great, great being here today and and speaking with you. I will. Uh, you, you, if there's any questions that anyone has, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best way you can get a hold of me. Great. Thank you so great. much. Thank you so um, much. Uh, I love a good uh, uh, story in the road. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I 